I'm Bob Gale. I'm the ecologist and public lands director of Mountain True. And we've decided to do a little thing here called Ask Bob and field some of your questions on various uh, things about plants, whether it's plantings in your yard or native plants or non-native invasive species. I've had a lot of years experience in the landscaping industry and as a botanist and a wetland scientist and a forest ecologist, I've sort of got a general feel for lots of things. So hopefully I can give you some answers that'll be helpful to you. Okay, so let's get to the first question. The question's from Susan F. And she says, why don't the figs on my trees ever seem to ripen? Well, Susan, figs are kind of a hard thing to grow in our mountain area, but they also are something called a climacteric fruit. Now, apples and peaches and bananas are the same kind of fruit, but here's the difference. These climacteric fruits only begin to ripen once they start producing a higher cell respira respiration rate and they start producing ethylene gas naturally within. Once that process starts, then the ripening process has begun and they will continue to ripen. With apples, peaches, and bananas, that happens a lot sooner in the year, but figs wait till the very end of the season to do that. And uh, you have to have some patience and give them a long time. They, they are gonna feel hard on the trees. Um, if you can kind of keep up with that, and when they begin to feel slightly soft, you know that process has started. At that point, you can actually pick them and take them off the trees and put them on a counter inside and they will ripen and they'll continue to ripen on the trees. But if you pick them before that point, they will never ripen. They'll stay hard and green. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, now, there is something you can do to try to speed up your fig ripenings. Um, you can do what's called pinching. In the Later in the middle of the summer, you can pinch off the smallest uh, fruits and leave the bigger ones. And that will hopefully, uh, theoretically anyway, d redirects energy into the tree to the newer um, more, produce, more uh, developed fruits, and they ripen a little bit faster. Uh, Susan had a second question. Um, how do I get my young ginkgo trees to grow faster? Well, first the question is, how old are they? Uh, ginkgo trees grow very slowly when they're young, and uh, if they're only three to four years, it's going to take a while. But after the first few years, they actually can take off and grow as much as 13 to 24 inches per year. But ginkgo trees do need four hours of sunlight. That's sufficient, and if you have more, that won't hurt them. Uh, but they do need four hours. So uh, check that out on, in your yard and make sure um, you can answer those questions. Uh, but don't despair. They will eventually grow. Uh, one other thing, don't add nutrients to them. They really don't need it. Um, if you add nitrogen, that can actually uh, slow down the growth rate of young trees. So hopefully that will help you, and um, that's about the limit of my knowledge on that subject. Uh, question number two is from Sarah G. She says, how do I stop my neighbor's English ivy? Oh boy, English ivy is a horrible non-native invasive. Um, it does take over large areas of the ground and grows up trees, and it's nonstop. It's amazing how it invades. Uh, the best thing to do, if you can, is to convince your neighbor that English ivy is not a good thing to have. It actually will kill trees. It will climb up, overcome, and cause trees to die, uh, both in covering up the canopy and preventing it from photosynthesizing. Uh, the roots dig into the bark and cause problems. And uh, it also doesn't really provide very nutritious fruit for wildlife. So if you can have a good conversation with your neighbor and kind of educate them, that would be the best thing. Uh, other than that, there's only thing you can do is uh, when it crosses your property line is to kill it there. And uh, there's not a whole lot else you can do about it. Um, if it's all on your property, an herbicide works. Actually, a glyphosate-based herbicide uh, sprayed will, in almost one application, knock it out, uh, uh, given at the late end of the summer. Uh, after that, if there are a few sprouts, you can usually pull them up. And I do know of, peop of one family that has pulled all their ivy up through several years of working hard with their hands 
and knees and shovels. Um, but that, that's pretty work intensive. But if you choose to avoid chemicals you, and have the energy, you can go that way. Okay, uh, question number three comes from Danny L. and Paul C. They both want to know how do they get rid of multiflora rose in their yard? Well, that's a, that's a tough plant, multiflora rose. Here's a sprig of one right here. Uh, it has thorns that are hooked down and uh, at the base of the leaf, if you want to know how to identify it, it has little eyelashes down here. Um, and uh, this plant uh, is best treated actually with an herbicide, uh, an herbicide called triclopyr. Um, brand name would be Garlon 3A. Uh, the way to do it though, uh, most people when they hear herbicide they think you have to spray everything. You don't. You actually can put a little bit of this in a bottle uh, with a certain concentration and you cut the stem at ground level and paint it on there. And it just goes into that plant and its root systems and it will kill it. It's very hard to uh, kill this plant without digging up all the roots and these thorns will catch you and tear you apart uh, while you're fighting them. So um, it's good to get in there with some loppers and cut it down near the ground and then get it at ground level and cut it. Um, so uh, hopefully that will help you all. And uh, the question number four comes from three people that have the same question. Nancy B, Melanie F and Sarah G uh, and Paul C, four. <laughs> um, they want to know, is there anything safe you can use to get rid of poison ivy? Yes. Uh, and some of them said they had high allergies, so they couldn't dig it out. So, yes. Uh, the, again, the uh, herbicide that has the compound triclopyr in it, that's T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R, um, that actually is very good for cutting and painting. Now, if you have gloves on, uh, you can find the stem where it goes into the ground and you can cut it with pruners and paint it and just make sure you put that stem somewhere where you're not going to touch it again and uh, wash your gloves when you're done with everything. Um, if, you, if you're so sensitive you can't do it, you might get a friend to help you. Uh, uh, and uh, the other way to do it is if it's a small plant, you can dig it up. And I always do encourage people to start by trying to remove things mechanically or manually and use herbicides as a last choice. But for poison ivy, that might be needed. You can also spray the leaves um, with the, the same uh, uh, compound, um, just spraying the leaves where they pop up, not hitting anything else in the area. And that will also kill it. Question number five comes from Melanie F. and Sarah G., and they also ask how to get rid of wisteria and Japanese honeysuckle. Uh, I can almost give the same advice on that. Um, wisteria grows up a tree or several trees close together, and you can actually cut the stems of it at the base of the tree and paint them with an herbicide, and that will go down and kill the roots. Um, again, uh, triclopyr would be the best choice, um, and uh, Glyphosate will also work. <clears throat> now for Japanese honeysuckle, if you have it in a big, large open area and it's a monoculture, yes, the, the best way and almost the only way to get rid of it is to spray it. Um, again, when you do these sprayings, there's a right way to apply something and a wrong way. Uh, I'm not going to go into all that on, on these questions, um, but you can feel free to contact us again and uh, I can give you some more information about that. But uh, sprays can be done safely, and that's all how you apply them. Um, so I have question number six. Linda Carolyn A. says, how do you get rid of vinca? She's got acres of it. Well, I always hate to hear that acres business because that means there's only a couple ways you can do it. Um, let me not uh, miss the fact that there uh, is a good use for goats. Goats can be used to graze uh, large areas that are a monoculture. They'll eat everything, but if you can use them to get rid of the above ground biomass first, then as things re-sprout, you can, possibly, depending on the species, you can dig them up where they re-sprout or just spot spray them. Um, Vinca 
is a very slow grower. Uh, it's invasive and it will take over the forest floor. So if it's under a forest, um, again, it, it will suppress everything else native that's coming up. So again, you can spray it one time or have goats uh, graze it if you have the property or the permission and can afford to rent someone's goats. Um, they usually set up a little electric fence and uh, leave them out there for a week and they move them around. Um, so those would be my suggestions there. Again, um, uh, triclopyr based herbicide would be the best method there. Question number seven comes from Susie J. And she's got uh, two, two questions. Should I begin removing all my non-native invasive plants from my yard? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, you can leave non-native invasives in your yard if, if they're, you can leave non-native plants in your yard if they're not invasive. But there's, even when you do that, there's a downside to them because plants that are not native to our continent and our region do not carry the right nutrition for birds and wildlife. And there are a couple of them that actually can kill birds when they eat them. Uh, the famous uh, incident that happened was the Nandina plant with the berries it produces uh, was uh, eaten by cedar waxwings, which consumed lots of berries, and the flock basically fell to the ground and died. And they just checked the stomach contents, and that was what they had eaten. Uh, that bird had never encountered these strange berries before and thought it was normal food. Uh, they didn't know to avoid it. So that's a tragic uh, thing we've learned about some invasive plants. So uh, for that reason and for the fact that most of these non-natives don't have the nutrition our wildlife, native wildlife has evolved with over thousands of years, it's best to really get rid of them if you can and um, move over toward native species. Uh, the other important thing for you to know is that, uh, and this was a recent study, um, the Carolina chickadee needs 70% of the plants in its uh, um, area where it, its habitat, where, it, where a, couple, a bird couple chooses to mate and have its young, where it feeds in the neighborhood there. It needs 70% native species in order to actually survive, um, to be a viable population. So for all those reasons, uh, Susie, I would say, yes, you should begin removing your non-native plants, especially if they're invasive first, and even some of your other ornamental plants, if you can find, and you usually can, a native replacement for them. Uh, your, her second part of your question has to do with an ant, and I'm actually not familiar with these. They're, it's the Allegheny Mountain Builder ant. Uh, apparently, wherever you are, this is a problem, and I, my uh, understanding is once they've built mounds up, uh, the only way to get rid of them is some sort of chemical treatment. But I do have experience with fire ants because I lived at the coast of South Carolina for a number of years, and people were using chemicals and they were using a lot of home remedies. Um, and the best remedy I found was when I saw a mound start in my yard, I, I boiled a pot of water and poured it on the mound. And that killed the mound uh, and killed the ants. And they didn't return for quite a while. Uh, when they did, I just repeated that. Um, but fire ants are a non-native invasive, invasive insect from South America, and so they don't really belong here. Um, I'm, I don't honestly know much about Allegheny Mountain Builder ants. They sound like they might be native to parts of our area. So I would do a little research and find out if they're native and what positive purpose they may serve for wildlife before you decide that you don't want them in your yard. Um, the next question comes from Valerie T. And she says, how do I get rid of Japanese knotweed? Oh boy. You've, you've picked the plant that has defied uh, every government agency and conservation organization that I know of, including ourselves. We have been working on that plant for a number of years. Uh, the roots go more than three feet deep into the soil. Uh, it's a non-native from uh, Northern Asia, Russia area, I believe. Um, and there's, it's a problem all throughout Europe even. Uh, we have found that by being persistent and treating it three times a year, in the beginning of the summer, in the middle of the summer, and in the end of summer, uh, with um, a glyphosate herbicide, 
um, that we've been able to knock it back to the point where it's almost completely gone and eventually is gone. We just wear out the root system. Uh, the, there is a new herbicide um, that's being tested by the U.S. Forest Service and actually myself, um, which is showing some very, very good results very quickly, much better than anything we've had in the past. The experiments are still going on, so I'm uh, reluctant to try to um, advise that one yet, but it's very wildlife friendly, so that's the good thing, and it could be used next to streams. Um, but uh, um, we are going to be continuing our experiment for the next uh, two years and uh, Forest Service began a year earlier uh, and I think we're going to find that that may be our best silver bullet for that plant. Um, and that the, the, the brand name for that is, um, there is a, uh, or the compound for that is Amazomox. But again, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, now I also have a question from Jim N and he's new here from New York. He'd like to learn more about the plants and uh, trees of our area, so uh, he asked if we knew of any good guides we could recommend. Uh, well, Jim, there, there, as a botanist, I can tell you it's really helpful to have a lot of different uh, uh, references and reference books, but uh, there are some really good ones out there. Two good ones. Uh, one of them is called Wildflowers and Plant Communities of the Southern Appalachians, and it's by Timothy Spira. Um, and the other one is Wildflowers of the Atlantic Southeast by three authors, Cotterman, Wyatt, Wait, excuse me, Cotterman, Wait, and Weekly. Uh, I will be happy to email you uh, the names of those books um, and if you want to contact me again. I actually think I have your email, uh, so I'll send those to you, and if I think of some others, I'll forward them too. Um, question number 10 comes from Leslie W., and she says she has a ton of what she thinks is lamb's ear on her 14 acres. She says, is it true that it is, it, it is, is it true that it's edible? Uh, yes, Leslie, um, lamb's ear is edible and it actually is a very, has some very good medicinal value. It's actually a very uh, potent antibacterial which fights staph, uh, sinus, and uh, uh, sore infections. Um, it's been used for actually centuries, apparently, and uh, for that purpose. But, uh, and, and it is edible. You can eat it fresh in salads or you can steam it a little bit. And uh, it tastes sort of fruity. Um, but what I'd recommend is that you take a good look at that plant first, because I think you may have a plant that looks very similar to it called mullen or flannel plant. Both of those plants have very furry, soft leaves. And uh, uh, the one that's called mullen is very invasive. Um, the the, the uh, lamb's ear is a little bit invasive in your yard, but it's not doesn't go out and displace things out in the forest uh, and in, in the wild the way mullen does. Uh, the way to tell them apart, um, le that was Leslie, I believe. <laughs> um, I'm, I want to make sure I get everybody's names right. Yeah, Leslie, the way to tell uh, lamb's ear apart from mullen is lamb's ear has leaves coming out in opposite uh, branching on the stem. So you'll see leaves like this, whereas mullen has alternate branching like this. Okay, and uh, mullen takes a couple years uh, to produce, to go through its cycle. It starts out as a group of uh, leaves down on the ground, and the second year it shoots up a tall stalk, sometimes almost as tall as I am, with bright yellow flowers that are very visible. Uh, lamb's ear doesn't have as showy of flowers and it produces a stalk every year but it doesn't get very big. Um, and then I have one final question from Crystal L. She said, I would love to hear how to get rid of privet forever. I have large trees of it on my property and I'm tired of digging roots and uh, feeder roots that go out from it. Okay, Crystal, that 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 is a, a that's one of the big three problematic ones we see in the southeast in general in our area. Um, fortunately, privet does respond well to uh, that cut stem treatment, I call it. it, it the, the technical word is cut stump treatment or cut and paint. You cut the stem at ground level and you need to get down within an inch of the ground so you're close to the root crown so that it actually gets into the root system well and that'll avoid re-sprouts. 
If you leave a six or eight inch stump sticking up, it's going to have an easier time re-sprouting. Uh, but uh, again, if you use that um, triclopyr based uh, herbicide, that will be the thing to do. And um, you just cut it and paint it on there. And, uh, and you can also treat them uh, in the late season after uh, native species have gone dormant. You can see it's evergreen and it's very easy to see it under the trees and in the woods. And you can go and pretty much knock it out. There, there's always going to be follow-up when you're treating non-native invasives because there's always some seed crop in the soil that's going to be there for several years. So you'll need be treating sprouts, but after about three or four years, you can pretty much get it down to 90, 95% removal of invasives. So um, that would be my advice there. And um, uh, I don't have any more questions this time. If anybody sent in any questions before we did this video today, um, I will move them to our next time. We think we'll do this maybe on a, a regular basis, maybe a weekly basis. And so uh, I, we have your questions, and if I missed any, I'll try to get to them next time. And um, with that, uh, thank you so much for your questions. It, this has given me a good chance to get outside during this COVID-19 uh, era and uh, do something helpful, even though I can't go out as much as I used to. Goodbye, everybody.